my first time doing this, so if I just really stop, sorry, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Um, the only other presentation I did was an IFC one, and the whole audience was six and seven year olds. So even if I was just totally watching it, they, they really didn't know. They're just like, oh, this is different than you know, being in whatever class. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Uh, this one is we bought some tools now. The, the idea of this presentation was that uh, based on the conversation I had with a, with a friend of mine who um, they were going to an organization with a very immature uh, security program. They said, okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll download some tools and get some free stuff and you know, then we're good. So they started with some good tools like Splunk. Um, you know, maybe a copy of the next post, do some scanning and said, okay, yeah, so uh, you know, we're good. We're going to be secure now because we, we have some tools. And that's not quite the way that it works. So my purpose here today is I'm going to try to give people just a simple guide to either starting up an information security program if there isn't much that uh, you're in your current place, or just looking around and seeing, um, okay, well, how does what I have compared to you know what this guy was talking about up here? And you know, hopefully they're you know, somewhat close. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Jim Bauker. I've been in IT for a bit now. I've uh, been in information security for last decade or so. Um, got degrees and certs and all that uh, garbage stuff. But the important takeaway from this is that when I'm at work, they say, oh yeah, he's the security guy. I work for a small company, so it's not a huge IT department. And I get a kick out of it when vendors ask, oh, okay, well, you're going to want to you know, go and talk to the you know, director of your SOC and meet with your security team. Go, no, sorry, that was just me. You know, it's just me. I have a couple of part-time people helping me out, and that's it. The reason why you want, uh, for a small program, you want somebody to know who the security guy is, so that when there's another request from something, there is somebody in marketing that wants to use some new tool, and they're going to put all their data out in the cloud, and they say, the salesman tells them, oh, it's fine, because we use AWS, so all our stuff is secure. I want them instead to say, <laughs> my response to I want them to say, well, we should probably just check with the security guy and see you know, if this fits in with everything else we're doing. So if you get nothing else today, any efforts that you make to ensure that folks outside of security are, uh, are talking to you about you know, new things, that's an important one. So anytime more security comes up, they should be talking to you. All right, the agenda. I basically put this together when I was doing my slides last night. Yes, I did them last night after the dinner because I figured that was a really good time to uh, do it. Because you don't really want to you know, not do these things uh, too soon. So what we're basically talking about here is, uh, and a lot of you'll notice is based around process, not necessarily technology. Um, so we'll start talking about framework, talking what I mean by that, uh, and how a framework helps to organize your efforts and portrays your initiatives in a way that makes uh, that makes a lot more sense. So if I just tell my boss, hey, I found this cool new tool, and it's going to cost 10k, 20k, 15k, whatever it is. But don't worry, we have the capex. We should do it um, because I think it looks really cool. He's probably going to say no because he's a little on the cheap side and kind of squeaks when he walks. But if I come to him and say, hey, this is the whole program too. We're putting together. We're doing this. We're doing this. Uh, prioritize all our risks, and if we do this, we're going to reduce our risk, we're going to make this better, we're going to solve world hunger, whatever it is, explain the whole thing out, and then this is what it's going to cost, and the reason we're doing this over this is because we're going to you know, lay it all out, then he's going to be far more likely to listen to what I'm saying. Uh, there's also plenty of things that you can do that don't cost a lot. Um, documentation just is going to cost your time and effort. So if you have your whole act together when it comes to a lot of documentation stuff, and then you can present that, um, it's going to change people's overall perception where is it just a security person who bought some tools and stuff, or is it that we've developed a whole program and uh, we're approaching with a much more uh, mature approach. Does that make sense? OK. What to do when your boss gives you a security checklist read the magazine? The reason I have this in here is because it's happened to me more times than I care to admit that uh, my boss was on a plane somewhere. He's not a bad guy. He's a point of care boss. And um, he's like, oh, I was reading the Wall Street Journal. And it said you have to do these five things. Otherwise, just, you know, the world's going to come to an end. So I need you to drop everything you're doing and fix these five things. That's what I read. And that's all that's important. 
and he's going to take away that as long as he told me that and I do something based on that, that you know, everything's going to be fine. So he doesn't care about all the things we're working on, the high-risk issues, uh, how we took care of prioritizing things. No, he's just worried about what he read in the magazine. So we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about Security Council. Um, again, this goes to a program's maturity level. Uh, security Council is not just security people, is what the name is, that you get a few key users from different areas and you're going to talk about security. So one thing you have to, not necessarily dumb it down a little bit, but to communicate it in such a way that non-security people understand what you're talking about. And what this gives you is it gives you buying. So if I'm talking to uh, the heads of some of the different practices and uh, someone from the HR department, somebody from the finance department, we're discussing, okay, here's you know one of the issues that we have to tackle. We're thinking of taking all of our external consultants and using multi-factor authentication at all. They don't need to know which tool we're using. They need to know that why we're doing this and what effect it has and everything else because this is where I'm going to get my champion from. So when all of a sudden the HR department finds out that, okay, you know, when we roll this out, they're going to need to, you know, take this little RSA token and, you know, put in this number before they can get to the network shares of why we're doing it. Uh, now I have a champion because the person that's going to communicate that to them is someone who is in all those discussions and understands that this wasn't something that was just a capricious and whimsical decision on my part. Uh, we'll talk about incident response plan just at least at a high level. We'll talk about policies, which everybody knows and loves. Uh, we'll talk about change management, environmental management, and some basic housekeeping stuff. And seeing as how this is my first time going through one of these, I'm sure I'm just going to race through the slides and then 20 minutes later I'll have no slides and uh, I'll do after that. But uh, there's only 16 here, you're already number three, so it's not going to be that bad. All right, information security framework. So this is a multi-purpose document. Um, it, it, it does a lot for us. So it's not that difficult to write, but what it, it helps you do is it helps you kind of uh, organize your thoughts, and later it will be used to keep um, to keep your process in line. It's, and I say here, I'm not going to read everything off the slides because I'm going to assume that everybody in this room knows how to read and we're at least at that level. So it doesn't need to include everything, but it really should. So what I mean by that is don't try at the first pass to think of every single possible thing you do in terms of security and try to put it into this one mammoth document so that when people say, hey, what do you do for information security? You bring up this wheel of power and it's got this document there. Okay, here's what we do. Nobody's going to read that. Um, Especially nowadays, and you know, uh, the people above you that have an attention span slightly longer than that, they're not going to look at it. So the idea is, an information security framework contains a brief description of some of the key things you do, and then uh, if they really care to read more about any given one, then you go to whatever documentation is there. So you might have one item where it mentions vulnerability management, and you tell them that basically just a couple sentences. We have a vulnerability management program. Like that. And uh, here's what vulnerability management is in one or two sentences. And if you care to read any more about it, we'll look at this document over here. So that way, if we change something about the way that we're doing vulnerability management, I would go and change that document. I don't have to change the security framework anymore. Um, when we have some new thing that we start doing that we weren't doing before, maybe we just decide that we're going to implement that. Okay, well, we should probably have some sort of strategy around this. So a person that's in charge of that program goes, and okay, we're setting it up, we're doing this, this, we're going to document our process. That's when you want to go and add something into uh, the security framework. So this shouldn't be a big, long, torturous document. It should be fairly small, a few pages, where it just covers all of the basic things that you're doing in terms of security. So. You don't have to think of everything once, just put down some things you can think of, and then it's a living document. And then when someone says, well, you do two-factor authentication, you didn't mention it here. Oh, right. You know, people don't have it in, so it should already be a living document. One of the advantages to taking a process approach for a lot of this stuff is it helps increase your maturity level. So by that, I don't mean that, okay, this sounds like it was written by a kindergartner. It means like uh, CMMI, capability maturity level models, that sort of stuff, which is a um, scale that goes from 1 to 5. Once you reach at least a level 3, it means that your stuff is well documented, you have processes in place, and ways to uh, make up these things. Information 
Interesting. Okay. So before this slide, I had. Uh, all right. Before this slide, clearly I didn't. Uh, I opened up my own version of these because um, my notes, just in case this didn't work, have a slide that's on here. So. But what I did is I, I basically, and when the slides are available, I'll try to make sure I have my act together and show the right ones with the, the right slides. But one of the ones I put in was one that just gave sort of a snippet of what a framework document would be. This framework document had uh, a large purpose section, and that was broken down into managerial, operational, and technical controls. So what I mean by those are managerial controls are the ones that, you know, somebody, a pirate chain said, hey, we're going to do, you know, this, this, and this. Um, they tend to include things uh, like the, the data security plan, electronic resources plan, how you handle physical security, do you do a risk assessment? Um, we set up the information security console that we started talking about. Uh, what do I have for employee training? I can move myself. Because some of the stuff is kind of boring. I don't know if you fall asleep. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, Talks about incident response plan, all that kind of stuff. Um, operational controls tend to be the ones that are people driven. So, what what do I mean by uh, people driven? One? Um, every year we make our employees sign off on some policies, do some basic training. Um, here's what they have to do for change management. Uh, you know, all the things that are items that you tell the people, hey, you need to do this and this and this, and what they're physically doing, as opposed to the Managerial ones, which tend to be much more policy driven, so it's a little bit different there. The technical ones, because they kind of go in a hierarchy, the technical ones are your hardware and software solutions. So, uh, you know, we put in multi factor authentication as a technical control. Uh, we put in that, so that just some random person can go and plug their laptop into the network generator. Like, okay, that's a technical control. Split our things into those three categories, we start adding them in, and then over time, um, document just gets uh, bigger and bigger as we keep adding things. So then if six months from now someone says, well what do you you know what do you have in place for an information security program? I can show them this one document, it's just a few pages and it lists the high level stuff as opposed to me trying to answer that question go, well, you know, we do a lot of stuff and I'm trying to think off the top of my head like what things I should say and everything else and it's not gonna sound like it. I can say, yeah, here it is right here and you get a far better impression. Okay. Magazine management. The reason that I put this in here is one of the mistakes that I've seen people make, and um, I'm including that because I've done before, is that uh, something happens like this. Your boss picks up the magazine, he's looking through, or maybe he's reading the Wall Street Journal. I read the Wall Street Journal every morning, not because I find it openly interesting, but I know if there's something in there that's related to security or risk or something else. Um, our head of general counsel, or maybe our CIO, will read it and say, oh, you know, what are we doing about this? Because this is the most important problem right now, because I just read it. Okay, well, you know, it's not the end of the world, here's what we have, blah, 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 here's what we currently do, so I know it's saying that, you know, we should do this, but here's what we do instead, or we already have this initiative, so you want to be a little bit better prepared for it. Some of those articles will use fear, uncertainty, and doubt to convince your boss, hey, yeah, you know, these five simple steps are going to solve all of your problems. And if you're not doing them, you're screwed. It's not quite that simple. Um, if it was, a lot of us wouldn't, you know, need to be here because they just would find a checklist and hey, do the five things on the checklist and we're good. So when he does this, he's like, hey, yeah, you got to do this. You know, whatever happens next, that's that's up to you. So some basic uh, do's and don'ts. If you tell your boss that list is crap, it, it's not going to go. That's not gonna. Um, it's not gonna accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, don't say, "Oh, yeah, that's great. I'll take that under advisement." And you can tell by my body language that you know, 30 seconds from now, I'm gonna completely forget this conversation. I really don't care what you said. Um, don't go to your boss and say, "Oh, well, you know, it's this and this naturally. This is more for the." He doesn't want to have a technical argument with you about this. So none of those approaches uh, really kind of help. So what I found that's far more effective is saying, okay, well, you know, that list isn't too, too different than from what we're already doing. Um, so we already do a lot of those steps. There might be some little gaps here in this. What I can do is I can take that list, and then I'll compare it to what we're currently doing, and whatever the deltas are, I'll send you a you know summary of the changes. 
But now this accomplishes a few things. Your boss feels like he accomplished something. So he's happy. He's going to be on your case for a while. Uh, your boss is going to say, oh, okay, well, this person looks like uh, they're on top of it. And one of the reasons why that perception is important is because not only it's true, but you generally have your you know shit together, otherwise you wouldn't be doing this. But it's also important because then later on, when there's some question where your boss is getting two different stories, and he or she has to decide whether or not they're going to listen to what you're saying or what this marketing person is saying, that's the next marketing. Um, you're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to take this person's word for it because I trust his or her opinion because these have been my other experiences in the past. You want to start building that rapport with people above you because if you just tell them, oh, well, that's dumb, or no, that's not what we're doing, or you start arguing. If I tell my boss why we should or shouldn't use NANIC, and they start explaining, well, you know, on the wireless network, you can do this, blah, 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 we have this, and even if we lock it down, they can just go on the guest from Starbucks and get here. He doesn't want to get up, because one thing he's not going to understand, so he's going to immediately go on the defensive, and it's just not going to end well. So instead, by doing it this way, you still can work on the stuff that you want to, or that you need to do, but it's a little bit of effort on your part, and it'll help cement that relationship. Does that make sense? All right, selecting a security framework. Um, one of the reasons that I put this in here is not necessarily that I really care which framework people use, but you should have one. And the reason for doing that is that um, if you don't, if people say, well, you know, how are you, you know, how do you know which direction you're taking things at a strategic level? Say, well, we're currently aligned with dot, dot, dot. So if uh, they come, well, you know, what are we doing about this thing? Okay, well, we're following this list of standards as opposed to this one. Now it becomes a discussion of, well, you know, is this the right framework that we should be following? Should we be doing something else? It makes much more sense to have some list so that you can show that you have direction and you're not just making this stuff up as you go. There are some easier ones, for instance, SAMS Top 20. What's really nice about SAMS Top 20, everybody here knows SAMS, right? So what's nice about that is it's prioritized. So number one is more important than you know number 20. So you start up here, you get these basic ones done, and then if later you decide to align with the NIST standard, the SP800-53, it's everything that's in there, um, all the stuff from SAMS is about 20 was distilled from that. So if you already have the basic stuff, you're already going to be well on your way uh, or it's going to more complicated ones. Um, for people that have to do stuff in the UK, Cyber Essentials is an easy one. Um, and if you look up HMG, Cyber Essentials, blah, 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 whatever the thing was, uh, you can find it. Same thing, it's a very simple list. Um, it's even small, instead of 10 things, it's actually just saying five. But for anybody that does any business in the UK, they'll want to know that you have those five. And in your policies and stuff, you list things that directly address those five and tends to make everybody happy. There's also some bigger ones. Um, the this one, I read the document, it's it's a little uh, outline, outline, it's a snooze fest. If you try to read that whole thing, it's, if you're having trouble uh, sleeping at night, try reading that document and it's annex things. It's, it's uh, less than intuitive, but it is a good standard and has a lot of things in terms of guidelines. Uh, ISO 27000, the nice thing about that standard, specifically Annex A, and, and yes, I have read the standard because I have nothing better to do. Um, it lists all, well, the 2007 version had like 133 controls in 2013, just changed around a little bit, but basically it just shows a list of controls. And uh, if you take that list from the Annex and you say, okay, well, what do we do for this control? What do we do for this control? Even without going through the certification, sort of use it as a good checklist to see how close you are towards aligning a particular standard. Um, you also figure out, uh, do I need a SOC? This is um, the SOC audits. I don't know if everybody remembers SSA 16. It's in the same vein as those. Um, the idea of having a SOC is, if it's not SOCs, uh, I can't believe the amount of productivity that has been lost in companies when I have to explain the difference. Sock and socks. The two totally different things. Why on earth they had to put those two names close, I have no idea. 
and uh, it wastes a ton of time. I wasted 30 seconds every time you're talking about it. <laughs> so basically with the song, it shows that I had a third party come in, and I gave them my list of controls, whatever those controls are, and they judged the either effectiveness of those controls, which is a type of SOC 2 type 1, or on SOC 2 type 2 would be, we'll see the effectiveness of those controls over time period. Do you have evidence that you did this? You say that you do, um, uh, you know, quarterly audits of your, uh, of your AD users. Well, you know, let me see. For this year, I expect to see four reports from the and sign-offs on there. That kind of thing. Establishing an information security council. So, uh, I touched on this a little bit to start with. Um, this accomplishes many goals. Um, it's a good way to engage the users on your initiative. So, before you do something that's going to potentially impact the users, you can never guess just how well it's going to be uh, received. And sometimes the reactions aren't necessarily how you expect it. So, for all our phones at work, we used to use. Um, that computer is where we had a best server. So they said, okay, well, if you want to use uh, your phone instead of a uh, company phone, and you're going to have any of our stuff on it, it has to be included in our MDM, so we're going to install that as this one. Okay, most people were fine with it. <coughs> then we moved to AirWatch, because it worked a little better for what we were doing everything. A ton of pushback. Can anybody guess why we got a lot of pushback on AirWatch where nobody really cared about Pez? It was because it said air watch in it. And everybody who pushed back said, oh, well, are you doing like a big brother kind of thing? Are you going to go my shoulder? And, no, I have plenty of shit to do. I could care less, you know, that you're sending cat pictures you know, to somebody. I just want to make sure that our email that might be on there and some other stuff, I want to make sure they have to your remote device. that device. I want to make sure that um, you're following some simple rules. I want to make sure that the device is encrypted. I want to make sure that uh, you know you have some kind of passport on it, so I can't just swipe it, unlock, and then you know do whatever you want to do on it. Um, I had no idea that we were going to go push back just because it was something with the word "watch" in it, and everybody assumed that that was Big Brother. Despite this, people already have Bez on theirs, which was our previous MDM solution. But that's the way it is. Having brought that up before the Security Council at first, I would have noticed that right away that people had this reaction, and maybe instead of saying the name of the product. We're changing our MDM solution from this to another one. Um, another good thing about the security program, uh, the Information Security Council, rather, is that uh, well, it's an industry best practice. So, um, but it's true. So, when someone says, "Well, you know, you guys should really have an Information Security Council," we do. So, it's just one more checklist. So, if somebody is basing your posture on if you have these things done. Say yes, we have. Them. It would be right in your uh, framework documents. Yes. So is this just a informational for these guys, or is this like a voting thing? It depends how much you question um, So what the way we run the one um, at my company is we have a few people, and there's some of the things that are just going to be that are non-negotiable. Hey, I want to let you guys know that this is what we're doing. Other ones, we say, well. We want to do this. These are some of the concerns that we think users might have. Or, what do you think you guys users, you know, your users would be concerned about? So, some of them tend to be more democratic approach. Some of them are more uh, totalitarian dictatorship. We're doing it this way. So, I try to leave the discussions as open as I can for as many things as I can because you get way better buy-in that way. If you just say we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. It doesn't work as well. But if you present two solutions to people, and the one on the left says this, and the one on the right says this, and the left one is the one that I want, if they read this first, a lot of times people are going to pick the one that's over here because it's on the left and not on the right. So there's little things you can do to change uh, people's opinions of things. Um, if you ask them to prioritize a list of tasks, I'm going to put them in the order most important to least important, and then ask people to prioritize this because. If I do that, they're far more likely to take it in an order that's closer to this as opposed to flipping it. And if you don't believe me to just take you know two groups of people and flip it with the least important on the top, and as people read it, they're like, oh, well, you know, maybe we should work on this one before this one. So there's things you can do to influence it and still give people the ideas that they're 
finding out what they need to find out, but um, the more engaged they feel, the better buy that you're going to get. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and it keeps the other folks happy because everybody wants to see, uh, you know, wants to see what it is. Um, so you want to spend your time on the changes that impact the business. So if we're going to be taking our Linux machines, we had some old ones that were in Red Hat 5 and I'm upgrading to Red Hat 6, I don't care. So I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on that we're pushing out multi-factor authentication, that we're doing other things that are going to impact the user. So if it's something that happens in the background that unless we screw it up, they're not even going to know, I'm not going to bother with those. Alright, incident response plan. This is an important one to have. Uh, there's plenty of templates out there and everything so you can get something in place. Um, it has a, basically, you can you know, read on there that you know, it needs to have its purpose, you know, what the scope of it is, when you should invoke it, um, what your definition of an incident is, because different people have different impressions that you should kind of spell out the stuff here. Uh, you want to mention that, uh, okay, well, any incidents go before the Information Security Council. Um, you should have an incident owner so that when you know something happens, okay, well, who's the person that's in charge of this? Uh, you have a response team. So you want to kind of start to define all this stuff ahead of time so that when there is that oh shit moment, like, oh, okay, well, what do we do here? We already kind of thought of, you're not going to think of everything. Um, my crystal ball has been broken for a good seven years now. But you can at least get part of the way there, and people are going to have a better impression when you go there and have, okay, well, yeah, we had this issue, blah, 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 this is the person that's in charge of the incident, these people are working on it, um, you know, here's our evidence, here's what we're following, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot easier to have that in place ahead of time than try to figure out what you should do uh, once you find out that the sky is falling. One of the important things that you should have uh, in this is a template. Because when there's all kinds of things going wrong, you're not going to be taking very good notes. Um, at least I wouldn't be. Um, I'd be running around with my hair on fire if I had hair, um, if there was something going wrong. But the idea is if you have a template, it says, okay, well, you know, what's the date and time this happened? You know, who reported the problem? Who's the person who's documenting this? Uh, you know, what's the severity of this? You have other definitions that you put in ahead of time so people know how to, you know, decide what the severity is. What steps we've taken and all the other items there. I'd go and read them all, but again, we'll assume everybody here can read. Uh, you should do a conference room pilot at some point, which is that you get a few people together, you know, maybe do it during one of your information security console meetings. Um, we said, okay, we're going to test this, so let's say this happened, you know, and so and so just reported it, they sent an email to whomever, and they realized that we had a decision. How would we handle it? And what that does is when you go through uh, an actual exercise, is there's often some unforeseen things that you can expect. We went through a uh, disaster recovery uh, conference room pilot and <clears throat> brought everybody together and said, okay, well, let's do this. And so we picked a scenario out of the hat, so we didn't know what it was going to be. Put it down and said, okay, well, if this happened, you know, what would we do? Oh, we need to talk to the facilities guy. And, you know, so we went to call the facilities guy. He didn't answer his phone. I don't know why, we just didn't. So we called the cell phone. He didn't answer his cell phone. Uh, then we called his home phone. He didn't answer his home phone. Not sure why. He wasn't work that day. I don't know if he was off the site somewhere. Or wanted, but for whatever reason, he didn't. So like, okay, well, now what do we do? So one guy said, well, why don't we just pick another scenario? No. <laughs> <laughs> if this happened in real life and we couldn't get in charge, we couldn't get in touch with Steve, you know, what should we do? And like, uh, we spent the next 15 minutes arguing about who we should call next. That was kind of dumb. But I wasn't in a position to influence everybody because there are a lot of people higher up on the food chain, so I can't tell the CEO, that's a really dumb idea, we shouldn't do that. How about we just talk to the person who, you know. So we eventually figured out, you know, who the next person would be, and then one of our next steps was that, okay, for all the people who are listed on our, that was a DR plan, but a lot of the funding is the same. If you don't reach this person, you know, maybe wait a half hour, and then if you still haven't reached them, then you talk to this person. Uh, if it's this type of issue and uh, you try to reach out to him or her and you didn't hear, this is the next person. So it was a change we made based on pilot. Um, you want to continually improve.
improve this based on observations you make. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously want to track your patient history, approvals, everything else. So if you make a change to this plan, you want to let, you know, you want to make sure that everybody knows about it. Policies. Everybody loves policies, right? That's what you guys live for, right? Um, unfortunately, they are kind of important. They provide guidance and clarification in key areas. Uh, and it forces your organization to think about issues. Uh, we put together an active shooter policy. It's kind of gruesome, didn't want to think about it. But after attending a talk um, during an guard meeting with the, uh, the, the guy that at the time was the head of the Connecticut State Police, he mentioned his things in terms of what happened with the whole uh, Sandy Hook thing and how that affected him. Uh, <coughs> and it was a tough speech to get through because it was obviously tough for him because even years later he was you know, reliving it as he was talking and giving many talks about this. Uh, but one of the things that he didn't count on was they, the whole thing in Sandy Hook was over in less than four minutes. None of the state troopers were there within four minutes. So by the time they got there, the whole thing was over, it was done with, but nobody knew yet, because they just got there and they're still trying to assess what's going on. So they sent people in to clear the building and everything else. But then what they didn't count on is that anybody who went into that building was useless for the next eight days based on what they had seen. So he lost the temporary, he temporarily lost three quarters of his people because anybody that had been exposed to that they, they were useless, and I can completely understand that if I had been there and seen, you know, what had happened on that day, I wouldn't be able to function at work. So things like this, you just hadn't even, uh, I mean, you just don't think of those kind of things. So it was interesting to get that perspective. So it's important to put policies together, figure out, you know, what you would do with things, um, and it also shows that you have a better maturity level, uh, again, for whatever you're doing. There's one of the things you want to do is check with uh, your HR department of legal. There's there's two types of policies. There's policies that have a capital P policy that create liability for your company. So even though it's if you created a work from home policy and said, oh, um, you can only work from home if you do this and do this and uh, you know you arrange for childcare. I saw that in a company's work from home policy, which is a horrible thing to put in the policy. Um, because now you're saying, okay, well, people that have kids, I'm putting them in a different bucket than everybody else. Um, as soon as an HR person saw that, he said, yeah. Is it okay if we take that out? And obviously, it was uh, taken out. Um, so there can't, you just have to be careful when you're writing policies and everything else that you want to make sure that your HR and legal department can take them up to make sure that nobody's saying something stupid. Um, you should also have a central repository for these because you want to, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, ours went through in a SharePoint page and uh, there's a little bit of metadata that has the dates for all of them um, that they were last reviewed. So as soon as it comes close to the date uh, that it's been a year, something goes through, we look and see who the owner is, it gets sent to that person and say, hey, you need to review this again. So at any given time, if you go and look at all our policies, you see that they've all been either approved or reviewed in Last, uh, in the last year. Change management. That was one of the last slides I did because I just hate change management. Um, but I, I did do it, so see, I, I have proof in here. It was on this copy. It just, I pulled up an older copy of my slides, unfortunately. Um, so the first step of this is, you know, why is it included here? Change management really doesn't sound, you know, like security. Um, well, for one, Especially if you have customers that are from a regulated industry, they tend to care. So, at my company, we do a lot of uh, we do a lot of work with banks. Um, they are obviously heavily regulated. So, before they are willing to use our services, they want to make sure that we have our shit together. Um, technically speaking, so if I don't have a mature change management program in place, I can say, okay, here's how we handle stuff, here's what's in our production environments, here's how we promote forward here, here, here's how we do uh, segregation duties. If we don't have all those, it's gonna be a big uh, check mark against us in terms of whether or not they decide that our security standards are where they need to be. Um, and also, auditors tend to care about it. Not a big fan of auditing, but it's a necessarily evil. It's gonna be here, it's not gonna go away, so, you know, so, 
the, the crucial takeaway from this slide, you can't see all my points here. If you could see my points, the most important one on there would be that it's not the specific tool or methodology that you use, it's the process. If you have a process in place and that process is documented, and you have evidence that you follow that process the way that it's documented, that is far more important than which tool you use. So if you have a crappy process and then someone says, hey, just buy this new tool and all your problems will be solved, you can probably fix it if you just take care of the process piece of it in the operational side of it. Do you have anything else on your I did, it's all awesome. See, look at this. Look at this. I had bullets and everything. I had comments below, but yeah, it's not on that one. So I did, see, because you're my witness right there. So. I basically talked about uh, why it's included, why clients would care, how process is more important than software used. Um, they're looking for process communication, all that. Right. Alright, vulnerability management. Note to self. Next time I do one of these, don't do the slides the night before, maybe give myself a little more runway to test it out. Vulnerability management is another line item that should be in that main framework document that we talked about. But it should also definitely, this is one of the first ones that needs to have its own dedicated document. Because vulnerability scanning, which everybody knows what that is, and vulnerability management aren't necessarily the same things. So uh, for a while, before I started the company I'm at, they had a of scanning in place. Great. So when I came in, I'm like, oh yeah, can you show me their reports? I'm like, yeah, I think we have reports here. And I saw this mailbox where they had been sending all of them. And apparently for the past 18 months, every month it emailed this report to this mailbox that nobody really looked at. And their reports never changed. They kept scanning. And it had hundreds of vulnerabilities listed. but anything with it. So they were doing vulnerability scanning, so they could check off, you know, that checkbox, but there was no management. Okay. Let's look at the ones that are, we'll just start really basic, sorted by CDSS score. Okay. So all these ones that we have, that are tens, that are on external systems, that are systems that we really care about, how about we start working on those first? So we took care of those, and as you knock out some of the high risk ones, some of the low risk ones go away as well. And then once we finished that, we ran the same scan again to make sure that they went away. And then we said, okay, now that those have gone away, um, what are the next highest vulnerabilities? And then we just kind of kept going through the list. And then we put together a management document that kind of listed out, you know, that's what we do. Um, so I would say that a good vulnerability management process is even more important uh, than having a good tool. It's great to have a good tool. You definitely should have one there. Um, but if all the things being equal, the process tends to tends to run out. Um, we talked about finding vulnerabilities and prioritize. You can do it based on asset criticality, how it scores on things. Uh, some people take it even further and say the probability of exploit. Well, yeah, there's this problem here, but it's a one in a million that you'll be able to do it. Or this one, anybody who has a copy of Metasploit can you know own it like that. Yeah, that's the one we want to work on. Um, there's also some benefit to changing scanners every few years. So one that we were using, and I won't mention the, the, the vendor because there's I mean, no two tools are going to scan and get exactly the same stuff. Had one tool, things were looking pretty well. Went to another tool, and it immediately found that we had a default password on a draft card or a server. So I was going, like, oh, yeah, you know, th th this can't possibly be right. We've been you know scanning this long ago. We couldn't possibly have this. So I looked at it and said it was on a certain server. So a draft card tools aren't used to it. It's just um, it's a remote access card. So that if your server hangs up and it's a Dell, you can go to this card and tell it to be would blow up. So in the Google, I know what the default password was on Dell draft cards. Found it up, went to that server, tried to sign on to the draft card. So I could reboot it. I could look at all these things I can do a server that I should have no access to. So I took a screenshot of it sent it to one of our sysadmins and said, hey, should I be able to see this? And what happens if I click this button? It's just being a wise ass, because you know, that's what I do. Um, so he freaked out about it a little bit and then cleared it. And I'm sure enough, then we can it straight. So it is a good idea to change every once in a while um, because of, uh, just because they're not always going to catch the same thing. Some vulnerability scanners are really going to care about uh, you know SSL stuff. Other ones are really going to care about, uh, you know, <clears throat> some older tools, so if you keep switching every once in a while, you stand a better chance of finding out everything that's in there. 
Okay, housekeeping. Um, again, a lot of this comes down to process. Um, it's really a good idea to list out what you should do monthly, quarterly, and annually. If you can't right now point me to a place where I say, what are all the security related things that you guys do once a quarter? Now, everybody knows kind of a little bit, well, you know, I do this, I do this, and you know, Susie does this other thing, and so I, there should be a list that says, um, for security related items, here's a list of everything we do quarterly, here's where they are, um, and here's the evidence of where it was done last quarter. Because what happens is, over time, there's some requirement, oh, you need to be reviewing this list quarterly. Um, one way. That wasn't me. Um, but it's okay, we're already on slide 14, so I'll just you know, power through the last couple. You'll just have to believe me, I'll ask her to verify that <laughs> you have um, You know, so that's why I had her sit right over here. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, all right. Um, the idea is if you have one of those lists, then when you get some new requirement that, oh, you have to start doing this quarterly, and then this person does one quarter, and then they forget about it, and then a year goes by, and then the client that asks you that says you need to do this, and all of a sudden you're scrambling because you have no, you know, audible evidence that you've actually been doing what you said you were going to do. And the person who's raising to it, maybe he moved on to another job, and when his job transitioned, he can say, oh, by the way, you have to do this in two so, again, if you have a process and you have some list where you have all these items, then it becomes really easy to, when you get a new one, you just add it to the same list. Again, we put ours in a simple SharePoint page. And if you pick the drop down that it shows that it's quarterly, it looks the last time it was done, adds 30, adds 90 days. And once sys date changes based on that one, that item goes right and says, like, hey, you need to do this one again. So every once in a while, I'll go on that page, and regardless of who it was that needed to do it, I can see whether or not things were done and which things, you know, which not done. It really works out well. Um, it also provides a pretty good mechanism for, uh, for capturing the evidence. Risk register. The idea of a risk register is um, kind of like a checkbook register, just a set of transactions. So you're walking down the hallway, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is security. Um, hey, did you know that on the 25th floor, I know you never go up there because you don't care about any of the people on that floor and their departments that you don't like, but they always leave the door propped open so that the mail guy can go back in. They shouldn't be doing that. So I think the walkway just kind of, you know, roll my eyes and go, or I can say, crap, I should add that. So I'll add that as one of the items to the risk register. Hey, you know, we have this problem where people tend to do this, because I'm not going to solve it right then and there. There's a lot of problems that we just end up admiring them. Ah, oh, well, not only that, but you know, then the people on nine, you know, this guy always tailgates because he never remembers his badge. So rather than just admire the problems, I'm going to list it in there. I'm going to put in whether this is, you know, a critical thing, whether it's a mm, okay thing, or if it's something that I'm not too worried about. I'm going to put who really needs to take care of this, and then what phase it is. It's sometimes just identified. So I have a whole bunch of identified things in my risk register. Things identified I haven't done anything with. If I don't leave them in there, I'm going to forget about them. Um, or is it something that I'm actively working on remediating, or has been completed? Once it's completed, I'm out there, it drops off that list, but I still have a separate view where I can see, okay, these are all the risks that we identified and have already been remediated. Um, it's not that hard to put together. It didn't require some really complicated software. We already had SharePoint. I just made a simple page. Ah, oh, crap, we've got one. Um, so, you know, you put this whole thing together and you notice, oh, you know, we didn't put anything about a risk assessment. We currently do those, and those are kind of important, right? So, you know, what do I do now? Well, look at what we already have uh, in place. Um, if you don't have a risk assessment, you know, that's something you should add to the risk register, right? Because that's kind of an important thing that you should have. Um, otherwise, if we're already doing it, we'll just add it to the framework document. Put in an A, we do annual risk assessments, and here's how we blah, 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 and this is what we do to remediate, these are the people that care about it, and all that stuff. So you put a document together that says what you do for risk assessment, maybe say where the copy is of the last risk assessment, and you add an item into that framework document. So at this point, we're, we're putting your process together. So if you start to follow this, you get a lot more organized, and then next time somebody asks me, well, what we do for security, one of the items that's going to show up under those controls is the fact that we do a risk assessment. And at that point, you can 
say, hey, look at that. Now we have a mature, well-defined, repeatable process for how we have stuff in there. And look at that. We made it through. I was hoping to do it in like 45 minutes. I think I was pretty close on track. So we made it. Stay awake for the whole time. Next one. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, you were saying like sometimes if you have clients who require that you have certain policies and stuff. So do you have like a general letter or a smaller list of your policies or will you give them a copy of those policies or do you just sort of give them a check box? Yes, we do. So the, the, the shorter answer is it depends. <laughs> the larger answer is that um, I keep two pages that show a list of our policies. One that shows our public policies that everybody cares about. It's on the H HR site so because our employees care about work from home, blah, 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 sick time, benefits, a few other things, maybe one or two of the security related ones. And then I have a bigger list that's the ones that tend to be more IT focused and only certain people in IT care about. So what we do for log management, key management, uh, stuff like that, the average person, Susie in accounting, does not care about how I handle graphic keys, nor should she. So we keep all of these in a separate kind of box. In addition to that, um, we make sure that they're all standardized, so each one has the same kind of header so I can see you know, who owns it, who approves it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then also, in terms of what I'm willing to give to clients, some of them just want to know yes or no. Other ones, they want a little short answer. So one bank that I had, I found out that the way that they do their assessments is they send me a spreadsheet, I answer all the questions, and then they try to just put in answers to whatever application they have. So it's a comment that they want to answer. They just went to each policy, found a snippet that basically references it, they were happy. I would want to say, well, I want to see your incident response plan. So I'll talk to the guy in uh, legal. Absolutely not. There's no way we're going to share that. We have for kind of how uh, Okay, so we reached a meeting thing. So now, in addition to having my incident response plan, every time we make a change to it, I take the first two pages that includes the title page, vision page, the table of contents, and the purpose. It only goes about that far, so it's like the first four or five pages. I take a PDF of that and I keep it there. So when they say, we need to see your incident response plan, I say, well, we can't share that with you. But what I can do is give you a snippet that shows the first few pages. So they look at it, and in the table of contents, you can see all the sections. Even though I'm not giving away the farm in terms of exactly what we do, that's enough to make them happy. They say, yes, okay, they have an incident response plan. I can tell that it's you know, put out, I can tell that as a template, I can see that they have a post-mortem, because that's a section I really care about. Okay, we're good. So usually that combination is, uh, is how we can go. Yes? You talked about you work with a lot of banks. How do you deal with their regulators, their requirements, whether they're contractual or something like that? Okay, so, yeah. Banks definitely represent their own unique set of challenges. They're heavily regulated, so one of the things that, if, if you're a bank, have all this data and you want to go to my computer and say, hey, here's a terabyte of data and I want you guys to analyze this and figure out what we're doing with this and then uh, you know, you'll bill us gobs of money on an hourly rate based on you know your findings and all that stuff. But before you do it, you have to answer the security assessment because one of the requirements that they will have is that they properly vet third parties, which would be me. So I have a kind of common list of things that I know that they're going to ask for. Um, not everybody asks for the exact same things, but they tend to fall in a, a certain category. So a lot are going to ask about my incident response plan, ask about a DR plan, ask what I do in terms of uh, overall information security. Again, if you have that one framework document, that goes a long way, because that's not showing any specifics. So I can still usually fulfill most of the expectations that a bank would have by having those documents without giving away all of the internal confidential information that I really don't like sharing with everybody. Some of the last, oh, can you show me a copy of your last um, pen test? Or your latest vulnerability scan? No. No. Because if I give you that, what I'm basically doing is saying, if you want to hack us, this is exactly where you should go. So no, I'm not going to show you. What I will share with you is that, okay, um, here's our latest remediation report. It found these vulnerabilities. They were found in this state, this was their aging, here's what we did to remediate them. So you know that we have a plan together, a copy of the vulnerability management plan, but I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm not gonna go and show you a copy of our latest pen test or our latest vulnerability test because 
I don't want anybody to say, okay, well, if you want to attack us, this is exactly where you should start. Sorry, one other question. What do you do around security awareness? Security awareness, a few things. Um, what we found for security, so there's two things. Um, phishing, nobody wants to listen to me, apparently. Um, so rather than just give a really boring training that everybody's going to have to listen to, what we did for phishing, we did for phishing, which is great. We put together this simple phishing campaign. It goes out to everybody. It's like, hey, click on here to give me funds or do whatever. Somebody clicks on something they shouldn't, and that brings up a training page that's branded with our logo, has my name on it, so that they know that this is something legit. So this was a phishing exercise. Here's how you should have known that it wasn't something legitimate. Look at the email address. It's the wrong. Look at the domain. It says, you know, this, but when you mouse over, it actually has an entirely different, you know, URL. Um, or better than this in grammar, you know, whatever the cases are. So we'll point out all the things that are wrong with it. And uh, the first few people that reported as phishing, I sent them a nice, hand, uh, nice letter with my signature on it. Hey, great job, blah, blah, blah. If you want to pack this Swedish fish. And uh, I sent it to the first five people that realized it's a problem. And that has worked far better. Our initial rates were when people would click on a fish, uh, it was like close to 30%, which is staggering. So, that means that one out of every three is going to fall for something stupid if something bad makes it to that person. Now we're down into the single digits. Um, so that's uh, worked out pretty well. The other thing that we do is, when you're training, you know, resist the urge to say, here's everything I know about fishing, and I'm going to try to tell that to everybody. That, that doesn't work. They don't want to know everything that you know. So for any given subject that you want to communicate to people, pick two or three sentences. I can only say two sentences to everybody about this subject, whatever it is. Uh, you know, public Wi-Fi, fishing, whatever it is. Um, get two sentences and then find a creative way to get those two sentences of information out to everybody. Um, you know, whatever it is. We created really simple cartoon characters. So we have a dodo bird that we've got someone to kind of sketch out a picture of a dodo bird. And at the bottom of the page it says, don't be a dodo. And now, once a month, we send out some kind of training that's on something, again, very little line. And at the bottom of each one, it says, don't be a dodo. And people have, you know, remarked that. And you'd be surprised that over time, not only did they recognize now that they're kind of knitting all of those trainings together, but it was very simple training, short. You don't want to hear that nobody wanted to look at it. So just keep it very simple. And you're better off having a higher, uh, higher reception rate for one or two sentences and a low reception rate and have it, you know, uh, not before. Anybody else? Yeah. All right, thanks.